So hi, I'm Simon Phipps. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about OSI in a minute, but I thought I would take the opportunity to show you how I'm doing the presentation. Uh, I'm doing a presentation here on a, um, a Google Pixel book, which is a Chromebook. Uh, Chromebooks are renowned as just being a web browser in a box, and that is indeed what's going on here. If you, if you uh, look at the browser here, uh, that Chrome window is running directly on top of the Linux code. There is almost no other software getting in the way of it running. But what Google has just introduced on the Chromebook is the um, LXD, LXC lightweight uh, container mechanism. And they have then uh, integrated that into the Chrome desktop so that uh, all of the uh, desktop environment commands that get consumed by KDE and you know, are consumed by the Chrome OS desktop. And they've then also integrated that into the font of the file system to give file access. And they have then set it up so that there is a default container that gets downloaded when you enable it. So um, when you start out with your Chromebook, um, you run in the settings here and you uh, ask to enable the Linux beta. When you enable it, it sits for about 10 minutes while it downloads the Linux uh, container, the default Linux container. And it then enables in the Chrome menu a terminal, so it enables this, this terminal here. And that's a full batch shell that you can use exactly as you would expect on Linux. That's running in a container on LXD. Uh, you can also start up a supervisory container for turning up which you can control uh, LXD using the LXC command line tool. And uh, you can, uh, if you decide to operate using terminal, you can run, you can have multiple containers on your program. So it would be perfectly possible to have a container just a development environment okay. and a separate container as a desktop environment and have them running at the same time with different apps. Or you could have two different versions of your development environment uh, running on them. So um, uh, they've done a reasonably cunning thing with the file system. Because it's running in a container, the file system is inside the container. And they had two, two different ways you could think about that problem. You could make the outside file system available inside the container, but they've thought the other way around. And they've made the file system inside the container available uh, out in the uh, outside space. So uh, down here, when I click on Linux files, these files are files in the file system inside the LXC, LXD container. And Chrome OS is talking across an API to pull out the different files and then manipulate them. So that means the integration is reasonably thorough. You like to use the Chrome OS web browser to download files which are then uh, inserted into the container for me. Uh, the integration is not absolutely thorough. Um, there, there are still features that are missing. So you'll notice in a minute, for example, oh, it's got all the code. You'll notice in a minute, for example, that I, I'm, I'm unable to detect that the program is running in your screen or in the paper office. So I can't use the presenting console. Um, but overall, I would say this, it is pretty awesome, and I'm very pleased with the, the, um, the environment that they've given me here. So therefore, I'm running uh, LibreOffice. This copy of LibreOffice I got just by uh, saying how to install LibreOffice, and it grabbed it out of uh, Debian. I think it's running 5.2 is the version that is on Debian that it was installed for me. I didn't ask any questions, I just grabbed it for one, so then it was updated automatically. Um, and it's also not using any particularly shiny user interface or something. So it's, it looks a pretty default uh, environment. So that's that's LibreOffice uh, on a Chromebook. Chromebooks are very clean. Uh, almost all the new ones have got one of its capability on them. The word on the street is that Google is going to be releasing some new Chromebooks on October 9th, which will have this capability. This Chromebook also runs any Android app. So this computer will run any Android app. It has a web integrated web browser that's managed for me by Google, and it has a Linux environment that I'm managing myself, which is containerized, so I can have multiple versions which I can back up. Um, I think it's the option of the Google browser. So there we go. And I'm not compensating by Google for particular. So now we now we've got a perspective. See, I talked EP to you, and now I'm going to talk OSI to you. Hope you all enjoy the cake. Is everyone okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, so the cake was a GPL license, and that means you're now a derivative of work. And that means that everything you do from now has to be open source. Okay? The cake is still alive. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to the store when you think the cake is still alive. Okay, yes. Okay. 
So, let's talk about open source. We've been invented the third decade of open source. OSI was um, 20 years old at the beginning of February this year. There's some discussion about exactly when it was 20 years old because the founders will disagree with each other about when they were old. It was somewhere around February 3rd, February 7th, February 10th, February 14th, and somewhere around there that uh, open source was coming. Now, open source Origins are in free software. Before open source, what you call open source today is called free software if you, English is your first language. And uh, the origins of free software are in two people. Uh, depending on which tribe you're part of, you may well think it's only one of these people. But the true origins of free software are in both of these people. Bill Joy, who was the author, the primary author of BSD units. Uh, the BSD license arose finally in arose from the licensing and the Cape Town Farm in 1977. Uh, and then uh, Richard Stallman, uh, the DPL arose around 1988 and 1989, but arises out of thinking that it extends back to the beginning of the 1980s. And both of them were building a world where software was expected to be freely available with the source code. And so the, the origins of the thinking of the philosophical system go way back. Um, uh, Richard Stallman says about free software that free software is software that gives you, the user, freedom. And that uh, use of the word free to mean an expression of freedom uh, is highly favoured by religion, is, is where we explain uh, the, the needs and rights of software users. But unfortunately, we found at the beginning of the 1990s, sorry, the mid 1990s, that when we were having discussions with companies about free software, uh, the executives heard the words free and assumed that they wanted to give everything in the company away without charging for it. And that word free took so much unexplained that many of us felt we needed another word to talk about free software in an environment where English is the first language. Now, in an environment where English is not the first language, the, the equivalent word for free is normally not a problem. And so, in the country, I'm very familiar with the Geneva Portuguese, where they talk about the software libre. And the software libre is open source. Yes, the phrase means free software, but it's the same thing. It's, you don't need another name down to the But in the countries where it is the first language, I'm convinced that you need another word to describe the four freedoms that we use, study, improve, and share software. And so, 20 years ago, Bruce Perrins was one of the people who was involved in selling our side. He says that open source is the name of a marketing campaign. Open source is a marketing campaign for free software. And the goal of that marketing campaign is to get as much business software as possible investing in free software. So I thought from the very beginning, it's not being a great concept, it has been instead to increase the amount of free software there is in the world. And to achieve that by not confusing business people about the intent of the software. Um, uh, because it's very easy to confuse liberty and price if you're putting it to your first name. And so uh, the statistic here is in New York, and you can see the dot crane of New Jersey in the posture of liberty. Hopefully they will think that liberty and freedom are the same. Liberty and price are the same thing. So open source uh, succeeded because it enabled software users and developers to advance software framework work as well as in their private lives. I think that's the number one reason why open source succeeded. Prior to 1998, if you wanted to work on software freedom, the only narrative you had to use with your boss was a narrative that started with the word free. And you started with the word free. Stop listening to the next word. Um, the open source marketing campaign allows us to have a conversation that lasted beyond one word. And as soon as people heard about the value of open source software, they wanted to use it. They could immediately see reasons to use it. So in the first decade, we went through a fairly rapid progression from being upstarts advocating for open source software to being in a Gold rush market where people were trying to invent this new business models. Um, OSI was founded in 1998. It was founded in a, a number of stages. There was a, a meeting of VA Linux in February 1998 where a, a number of leaders of the open source movement uh, met together to 
discuss how to explain free software to businesses in the, in the context of the difficult discussion that had just happened at Netscape over liberated and what became the Zillow. And that experience informed their understanding that the word free was required in marketing terms. Um, uh, the first decade uh, is a rough bit of the timeline for you. Um, the term open source was coined in 1998. I, I have to be a bit more careful with that phrase for you. There were people who were calling free software open source as early as 1996, as far as I can find. And I've met people who claim they're using the term earlier, although I can't have their memory. I think they may be misremembering. Um, but uh, open source as a movement started in 1998, Christine Peterson crystallized the thoughts of the people in that room of the and said, hey, wouldn't this be a great term to use? And those leaders in the free software movement said, yes, that would be a great term to use. Initially, Richard Storm was a great idea. The first six months, he was very supportive of the idea. But I believe that he had uh, some personal uh, arguments with some of the founders of the movement, and he rapidly introduced this to a process with great faith. Uh, I don't think there is any reason today why a free software supporter should not support open source software, or why an open source software, so software supporter should not support free software, because they are just the same thing explained differently. Uh, the open source definition, as it was uh, published in 1999, that was created by Bruce Perrins. He was the author of the Debian Free Software Guidelines, and uh, he, he was in the middle of writing the Debian Free Software Guidelines when Eric Perrins said, that they needed an open source definition. And Bruce said, here, yeah, it's this. And uh, so the two things were absolutely identical on day one. They had diverged ever so slightly since then, but they are still close enough for you to treat them as if they're the same thing. Um, at the beginning of the movement, most open source software was a dropping replacement for the proprietary software, often on the desktop. Um, and uh, so early on, the big challenge was to market control of Microsoft. And Microsoft, as a consequence, was not impressed at all by open source and was particularly dismissive of Linux and described Linux famously as a cancer. Um, uh, that didn't stop people jumping on the bandwagon, but in the mid part of that uh, decade, there was a rush of new open source licenses. There was also a rush to make money off the components of open source so soon. IBM and Linux. And in 2004, it became apparent that Microsoft's opposition went beyond calling Linux a cancer. It was actually an organized campaign to found out how to develop Linux. By 2005, Unix has, had switched to being open source after uh, nearly 40 years of being proprietary software when Sun made Solaris uh, its open source software. And by 2006, the standards movement was beginning to realize that source for implementations, which is why I was the open source for part of the In 2007, I made it for open source, and uh, so the last key platform in the business desktop was now open source. The, the uh, application server was open source because of Tomcat, Java was open source, the Unix operating system was open source, what more did you need? So by the end of this first decade of open source, 2008, I'd say that most CIOs understood what open source was. They understood that it gave them a business benefit. They understood that it was about collaboratively maintaining the software that they depended on, instead of uh, needing to pay a license price. Um, it took a little while for people to catch on that you still need to carry on paying. So, what made open source licensing succeed? Well, I think there are three things that I'll rapidly run through for you. Um, what OSI does is it crystallizes consensus about licensing and takes away the uncertainty from software developers. So I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, secondly, open source licensing is multilateral. That is to say, it is between all the parties that are maintaining the software. All software licensing prior to that would be bilateral. It would be between an owner and a user, and hence the term end user license agreement, which is a bilateral. Of the copyright owner. But by being multilateral, by giving blanket permission, open source took uncertainty out of development and deployment and set you free to do new things. And finally, open source creates safe spaces for 
and other ways we talk about that. So, when I talk about crystallizing consensus, I'm really talking about the license review process. The license review process is the process by which the new open source license gets OSI approval. Uh, it's very important that licenses have OSI approval uh, because that is the, the, the gateway marker that tells developers that the terms of this license have been checked and there are no traps. And it's possible you could consider other licenses to be okay to use, but you, you wouldn't have any reason to have that influence beyond your own opinion because you wouldn't have anybody else's collective agreement or collective wisdom to rely on. So what OSI does is OSI doesn't act as the king of open source. Rather, OSI is the speaker of the house. It moderates the conversation. We have a conversation about the license. There's a conversation going on right now. The license will be made about a proposed new open source license. And members of the community, anybody, you're very welcome to join in, are welcome to join the discussion <coughs> about the license. Uh, when that discussion settles down and all the, all the opinions seem to have been expressed, then OSI's directors summarize the conversation and see if there is a consensus. And then if there is a consensus, the OSI board votes to agree that the consensus has been reached and that license is now approved. And so what we do is we crystallize the community's consensus. We stop the debate from carrying on forever. And we say, okay, all the, it seems all, this, all the, the opinions have been expressed. We're going to cut the conversation off now. We're going to say, I thought this license is approved, or I'm afraid this license needs some more work. Uh, I don't think we've ever denied approval for a license. But there have been many cases where we have said the license needs more work before it can be approved. And that's what's going to happen to the license that's on the license review list today, by the way. It seems to have been thought out very poorly, and the author is going to get some very hard public advice given to him by some very expert people. He's not going to like it. That's why, by the way, we don't want to try and do open source licenses. We now have about 80 of them. We think that almost all of the cunning ideas have been tried out. And if you come up with a new kind of idea, I very much recommend that you check with a friend before you post it to the license review because we're not very gentle with people who haven't done that all day by the way. Let's do that ever very gentle, we're definitely not gentle now. So I talk about bilateral licenses. So if you ask a lot of corporate lawyer, the lawyer will tell you that a license describes the environment for a business relationship. It is the truth between two companies that says where they uh, hate each other and where they love each other. It is the grounds of your agreement or disagreement. An open source license isn't like an open source license is the constitution of a community. It describes what rights are going to be available to everybody and uh, what the terms are by which you will acquire those rights. The rights that are going to be made available to you are the four freedoms the freedom to use software for any purpose, the freedom to study the source code, the freedom to improve it to better meet your or other people's needs, and the freedom to distribute either the original version or your modified version. And all open source licenses give you those four freedoms. We guarantee it, it's been checked by the community. So open source licenses are a multilateral consensus of the permissions and norms for a community. And that's why you never try to argue them, you never try to debate them, you never try to negotiate them. Because they've already been collectively agreed by a community to be they described now that now a lawyer. Uh, they describe the norms that you're going to need. I talk about creating safe spaces. An open source license creates safe spaces for a community to collaborate. It does that in three ways by mitigating control points, by isolating business models, and by guaranteeing rights for unknown and other parties. Uh, by mitigating uh, ownership of control points, what I mean is that an open source license gives you all the permissions you need in order to use the software and collaborate with others around it. And uh, you can reasonably safely assume that it is all of the rights that I've put on the slide up here. So I've tried to assemble into an English acronym for you, just so you can remember what rights are granted to you. Um, secondly, isolating business models. Open source does not have business models. 
businesses do. And an open source community that's, has, that justifies a behavior in order to promote or defend a business model is acting in problem. An open source community has got to enable every participant to satisfy the motivation of frame that brought them to the community. So if your motivation for coming to the community was to make a profit, we should not be infringed on your freedom to do that. But on the other hand, uh, my freedom to make money should not take away your freedom to make money. And so open source isolates the business models of all the participants and stops them from messing with each other. And uh, uh, because of that, open source communities are often places where there is a lot of commercial involvement. Because it's safe for competitors to come together and collaborate over the software that does not differentiate. Uh, and that's the reason why, if licenses are being brought for approval, OSI will not make exceptions to uh, allow to accommodate a business model. So the discussion going on, for example, about the Redis use of the Commons clause in the open um, source license, or the attempt to have a, uh, a no harm license, both of those are going to ultimately fail to be recognised as open source by OSI and by the wider community because they fail the test of isolation of business models from each other, or isolation of motivations. Uh, open source removes all the barriers to collaboration by giving you permission in advance. And uh, I think that that is the primary reason why open source won. And I'm very careful about saying that open source won, but open source became, by the end of the first decade, the default assumption It was not the default way you work in a specialist software market, such as an embedded software, although the embedded market uses an awful lot of open source software. But in the commodity or COPS software market, open source is the default assumption to make a better argument. And it did that because reuse beats re-implementation, but collaborative development beats reuse. And uh, the only reason we didn't used to do collaborative development when I was young was because you didn't have permission. Your boss, or you had to ask for a lawyer, or you had to ask for both. And so both reuse and clarity are chilled by the mission seeking. And software freedom of the source grants all the rights you need in advance. And an OSI approved license guarantees you that you have those rights. So um, I hear people argue that new license doesn't need OSI approval. I think that that's a mistake. I think developers don't check license with their lawyer. They check their license with OSI and with their SF and ask if we've approved it. And if we have, they say, well, that's good enough for me, I'm going to go. And if we haven't, they say, well, I don't really care what you lawyers say, because OSI and OSI have to approve it, and it must be a problem. Um, so I think this role we've been playing has been a, a really valuable role in the first day. So in the second day of open source, things, things move differently. We saw broad enterprise adoption. We saw the bane of software patterns becoming real. And we saw arguments about PPA enforcement. Uh, just a quick summary of the decade for you. Microsoft, by 2015, had decided open source was no longer a cancer. And in fact, they had unloved it. Uh, and I think that by 2018, that statement is gradually coming true. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about why I think that. Uh, today, open source is at the heart of almost all new software. Even if it looks for branch or a box, it's probably open source inside the box. Uh, in my view, software stops being open source if you don't have software freedom from it. And so when you put BSD inside packaged software or BSD inside uh, embedded hardware, um, there may well be open source software in the box, but it doesn't give you software freedom, so there's no point in you considering it. So what lessons have we learned? Well, we've first of all learned that the landscape is changing. Um, there's a picture of a campsite uh, in uh, Yosemite National Park where the rules had to change. And the rules had to change because open source came along. I'd suggest to you that today the rules are changing again. That the place where you can make money with open source software is changing. Um, I, people are saying to me they think open source is now redundant because of the cloud. I don't think that's true. I think 
what instead is going to happen is we'll see a change in the way that people use open source. Open source is a real value is that it lets you innovate without asking. It lets you start where others ring. It's kind of a step ladder up onto the giant's shoulders. It lets you stay in control of the resources that you make if you want to. And it lets you spend your resources on enabling other people to collaborate with you instead of reserving them purely for direct monetization, which used to be the only option. Uh, it lets you uh, innovate and then let others maintain uh, the maintenance of your innovation. Uh, it lets you influence global ecosystems even though you're small. Uh, the Blockchain Foundation, LibreOffice, Open Office before it, uh, uniquely challenged Microsoft's business dominance. And I believe it was Open Office that brought down Microsoft Office as the dominant force in computing. Because we came up with Open Document format at the beginning of the 2000s, we came up with a, uh, a compelling alternative to Microsoft Office. Um, I think we were often the reason why Microsoft their price by changing their capabilities, even in the cases where we didn't actually end up being used. And uh, one, of the, one of my great regrets is we didn't find a way of monetizing being used to reduce Microsoft's sale price, which would have been great. If we had got some of a cut of the business savings when people said, if you don't reduce your price, we'll use open office, we would all be rich. Wouldn't be money. New technologies are only possible with open source. I don't think you can do cloud without open source. You would be lost in a hell of negotiating licenses for things every time you try to automatically scale with open source. I don't think you can do IoT without open source. Because you really don't want to count how many things there are out there all the time to do license management. And so I think open source is a fundamentally enabler enable for the future. I don't think it's outmoded simply because the desktop is dead. I think that it is actually still incubated in every development that happens. So what's happening in the third decade of open source? Well, I think we're going to see um, um, five things happen. I think we're going to see the community becoming more and more ascendant in what is going on with open source software. I think we're going to see um, single project companies finding it harder and harder to create a business model and succeed. I think we're going to see uh, licensing change. I think it's going to stabilize and there's going to be some, some consolidated, and there are also going to be some challenges to it. I think we're going to rediscover the primacy of software freedom in using open source software in the enterprise. And I'm um, sincerely hoping that ISI, where I'm still president at the moment, will uh, move into new roles and take um, new, form new functions in the service of the community. Um, I think that we're heading into a community world where we're going to see most people who work with open source be generalists. In the previous decade, most people who worked uh, who earned their living from open source tended to be specialists on a particular thing. But I think open source is good very much about assembling solutions. And I think that open source people are going to be the assemblers of solutions and thus uh, deep generalists. Uh, in order to prepare for that, I recommend that in wherever you work, you cultivate a culture of contribution uh, and a culture of collaboration. Because the key skill that every software developer will need for the future is working in community, possibly uh, working in community remotely. Um, secondly, I think single project companies are going to face a challenge in the future. Uh, the first decade of open source was all about open source business models. It was the blockchain in its day. Every presentation you heard was talking about open source business models. Just like every presentation you heard today is talking about how they're using the blockchain and would you like to buy their new coin. Um, by the second day, we were seeing open source change into something where people really would like to have a release trade model so that they weren't under the control of a dominant provider of their software. And in the third day of open source, I think we're going to see companies differentiating rather than differentiating by the way that they deliver a single product. And as a consequence of that, I suggest that you get really good at managing a complex assembly of single parts into something that's unexpected and beautiful. 
Um, like some of the last consolidation. Uh, I think that the first decade was everyone wanting a license of their own and they didn't name it. Those were those were all vanity licenses. Um, companies that I, both companies that I worked for made them IBM made them, uh, what was called the IBM public license. And uh, they made them in the Eclipse public license. And uh, some made them on some industry standards uh, license. Uh, by the second decade, we realized that we really didn't need that many licenses because licenses were about bringing communities together, not the communities differently from each other. And what became the dominant problem in the second decade was compliance in the world of so called licenses, particularly the UPL. I think in the third decade, the biggest problem is going to be other kinds of compliance. I think it's going to be compliance in particular with attribution. I think that if you are maintaining the building system, you really should learn to accumulate all that trash um, because one day it's going to be really important to you in a law court. You need to make sure that you maintain a history of who contributed what. Give credit freely because by giving credit freely you'll remember. And when you're challenged, you'll remember in a way that satisfies the term of the license that you're producing. And I recommend you only use OSI approved licenses no matter how seductive the idea of adding a ride on to the license might be, or using an unapproved license like JBSD, please don't do it because you'll discover that uh, compliance with the terms of those unapproved licenses is going to be a burden to your production process. Um, I think we're going to rediscover software freedom. The first decade of open source, we tended to underemphasize the moral basis of free software because that was the whole reason we started the open source movement, was to give people a different vocabulary to explain software freedom. Um, but in the third decade, we're now facing new problems. And the solutions to those problems are almost always best derived by looking at the freedom of the end users to use the source code of the software. And I think in this decade, we're going to rediscover software freedom as our compass for solving the new business problems as they arise. And I hope OSI is going to continue to have a role. Uh, I believe that we will have a role on open standards, on community verification, and on assuring the authenticity of uh, software when it claims to be free software. Um, I recommend that uh, you'll probably, as if your, your employer is probably being implored to join the Linux Foundation, or to join the Eclipse Foundation, or to join it with some other consortium. And I think you should do that because that is the new way that open source communities are coming together. But don't forget to support OSI, Free Software Foundation, perhaps the Software Freedom Conservancy, because you need us pure characters to argue for the fundamentals. Uh, if you only support the consortia and don't support the characters, you'll find that it will be easier and easier for a bad actor to take over your business from you. So you need us. And I encourage you to join. So that's the, the third decade of life style that I'd suggest we for open source. Create cultures of contribution and collaborating in the world. Uh, get really good at complex assembly of simple parts. Uh, automate and accumulate, accumulate and accumulate the information you will need for future compliance. Not just reciprocal license terms, but also non-reciprocal licenses like BSD, Apache, and MIT. Share it software free. Tell other people why and cultivate characters as well as consortium in your business life. Um, and of course, please join. It's only $40 to be a personal member of the Open Source Initiative, and we spend your money very wisely. Uh, very small staff who do wonderful things. None of our directors are paid, I'm not paid by OSI, and uh, we, I think, deliver a great deal of value for you, Mark. And, uh,